I, I wonder what your connection was uh, to this material because I, I wonder if you were sitting there like, yes, finally I can make my ab scam movie. <laughs> so, so, so how did this develop? I, I think it really, t for me, began um, with uh, Amy and Christian on the movie called The Fighter and Mark Wahlberg um, and Melissa Leo and the sisters in that picture, which to me was, I'd written Silver Linings before that, but that was where I really discovered this world of characters that I loved and I said I think I can keep making movies in this world. I very much love it with the uh, salt of the earth instinctive people um, who are trying to survive. And Silver Linings then became another kind of chapter of that for me and then this, the characters just jumped out at me. And I found myself talking to uh, Bradley who was in the cutting room of uh, Silver Linings and I talked to him about it and I talked to Christian in his backyard about it and uh, what we seized upon was the, the larger notion of of, of people reinventing themselves, um, of, of how people have passion and what an artist, he was almost like a, th he was almost like a theater director and these were all members of the company um, uh, and how everybody everywhere has to sort of create a self that they believe in um, and that at certain points that has to change. So these were the ideas that we were talking about. Hey, I had a great deal of fun playing both. I really loved uh, playing Dickie. I really loved playing um, Irv and, uh, you know, both both based on uh, real characters. Um, with, with this one, uh, you know, uh, more distant um, uh, uh, from uh, uh, the, the actual man who, uh, you know, was hired by the FBI. Um, but I think, you know, the, the, the very uh, original script was more like a historical drama. Right, uh, it was more of a sort of a plot-oriented point, and then what David was talking about, you know, I remember walking around uh, my back garden, and we were talking about, oh, what do we like about this? And it was always about this this notion of reinvention of yourself and um, being born into circumstances that have nothing to do and no choice of yours, and and everybody's uh, desire, if it's not what you want, you know, to be able to change yourself and to reinvent yourself, and. Um, and the sense of performance. So in that sense, yes, very much about to do with uh, you know uh, acting as well. And if you're going to do it, you got to believe it yourself. You and as a con man, you know you have to believe it. You can't just. It's not enough that the other people believe it. You have to be believing it yourself. You know, as an actor, if you're invested, you're always going to kind of be wounded by your character in some way, and you try to, you know, drive a certain amount of distance between your life and your character's life. But they bleed in between, and and. Definitely I could feel sort of the cost of reinvention and sort of the hustle that we play on ourselves and the lies that we tell ourselves in order to reinvent. It means you have to leave something behind. And sometimes if you reinvent and you don't actually deal with the shit, then you end up with the shit, <laughs> you know? And so that's sort of where uh, Edith finds herself when she's confronted with um, the truth. And, and so she has to, as uh, she so brilliantly says, sometimes all you have is some I won't swear, but toxic, messed up choices. So that's kind of where Edith finds herself, and no truer words are ever spoken to Edith than those words from Rosalind. And then there's Rosalind, who blows up a microwave and consorts with <laughs> gangsters, and uh, yes. But she's, she's young, and she's naive, and I think that people can be manipulative. I think some people can be manipulative without realizing it, and, I, and, and some people can be manipulative by saying I'm going to I, I am manipulating this situation but it's only to to do the right thing it's to get she she believes that divorce is wrong and she believes wholeheartedly that she and Irving should be together and so she, by imprisoning him she's doing the right thing and by dangling <laughs> her son his son um, that is her version of forcing him to do the right thing um, and, you know, when everybody is afraid of, of the mafia, she sa thinks this is a perfect opportunity to ruin Irv's night <laughs> to get back at him because he deserves it. Um, so her thought process, I think the, the, the one line that kind of sums up Rosalind for me was when we were having an argument in the bedroom and um, I was packing up to go to Miami <laughs> to run away with um, a, a mafia member and take his son with me. And I said, and she said, why can't you just be happy for me? <laughs> really makes it very clear that she's, she's, <laughs> how can you be mad at her? She's so <laughs> clueless. Because, um, you know, we, when I read the script and we had, you know, all of her actions and, and the most exciting part was David and I coming up with, why are they that way? Why is she this way? There's that, there's that scene, right? There, there's that one 
which uh right i mean where the, we changed everything there was that morning yes and there was a, there was this very very crucial plot point which which david quite correctly he said you know i don't like that anymore and so we went and sat in the bedroom for you know 15 minutes and said well what are we going to do and it ends up being that fantastic scene where you get you get um irv going in and having a go at her because her boyfriend just put a bag over his head and is trying to kill him. And then the scene ends with him thanking her um, for doing that. Not exactly a symmetry. You know? yeah. All his movies have that beautiful combination, the dance between comedy and drama and the, the magical moments of humor and, and, and utter loss. And, you know, I, I, you know, that's all over all of his films and it's certainly here in this movie. Uh, you know, one second, you're laughing, hopefully, in the next minute, your heart is breaking for these people. Uh, they're rich and they're complicated and they're hilarious, hopefully, and more than anything, they're a bit magical. You know, there's a lot of, lot of magical moments in this movie that uh, are all because of, uh, you know, the way that he sees the world, I think. Well, well, first of all, I never viewed it as a comedy. Um, I mean, even if people do consider it just that, um, you can't play comedy anyway. Um, so my part, all I can do is focus on the truth. and work every day to um, make those truths uh, interesting and um, believable. And that's the, those are my parameters. I gotta, I gotta say, I never viewed it as a comedy either. You know, I mean, uh, to me, uh, because, because for a comedy, you're playing for the laughs. So, uh, to me, uh, you know, we just, we just did it truthfully and that ends up being funny because people are funny. And situations are funny. You know, uh, but uh, to me, um, the, it's uh, it's uh, it's whatever the hell you want to call it. But um, I, I would say there's there's a lot of funniness within it. But you know, people, every single one of you out there, you got a hell of a lot of funny stuff about you. You don't even realize. Um, you just you just you just you, you just you uh, we're laughing at you right yeah, now. Yeah, we're laughing inside in fact, right now. At but you. you know, you you, you you just play it for real. And when, when you've got these real situations and these fascinating characters, it becomes funny. So I agree with Jeremy on that. Like, I never actually looked and went, hey, we got to go for laughs. There's no nudge, nudge, wink, wink looking at the camera whatsoever. Some of the funniest moments in the film were never plotted as such. I mean, you get one of the biggest laughs in the film, which we never anticipated, when, when Richie, or Bradley's character, apologizes to Amy and you in the hallway after she smashed him over the head with a, a glass picture frame. He says, I'm sorry, you okay? Amy says, I'm so okay, are you okay? And he says, Irv, I'm sorry. And I didn't know what you were going to do. You know, <laughs> and he goes, he goes like, I try to imitate it and it's impossible. I love it so much. He goes, he goes, <laughs> He does it twice, like he's going to go, I, and he, can't, he has nothing to say. He's not going to say yes or I'm also sorry. It's just like this whole situation is just ridiculous. It's just like I have nothing to say to you. And I remember you made a joke that day. You said, should we hug it out? Because <laughs> Irving would not want to do that with this man. I want each one of them to do every range, you know, and then I write, I write for Amy, you know, and I see Amy last year at different events and I talk to her about how I want her character to be the rawest I've ever seen, the most raw, like in the curlers, and also the most, the most cunning and beautiful that I've ever seen in the same role, you know? And, um, and, and telling Bradley I want him to be from the borough and I want him to live with his mother, which is the first thing we talked about, which is always so fascinating to me, you know? That he's, that he, what's motivating him, you know? And, and Carmine's house I wanted to live in basically with all those kids. I mean, I loved making that home with him. And, and being, and my son played one of those kids. And, and you know, telling him about all my favorite, I try to give my favorite stuff to everybody, like the Duke Ellington, because it's personally beloved to me, and I hope it's at least, if they have to fake it, at least credibly, they have, that it's something they can at least relate to. I, I give it to from myself. So all these people have a love for life. Amy's character has a love to, to reinvent herself, and she embraces a new identity. I've, no, I've known people like that my whole life. My father's had friend, friends from the Bronx. You're like, that guy's from the Bronx. He looks like he's an English lord, you know, but he, how does he pull that off? But I guess, okay, he does that. And, you know, and he decided to do that, you know, business associates of my father's. So that Amy does that and becomes British, which is a, a wonderful moment, um, that, that, that's what I live for, their love of Duke Ellington together, that they both knew that, their love of, um, and it's for her with, with Jennifer, the love of the child together. Um, and sort of a fight becomes a, a mar in a marriage becomes a weird love of its own in a weird way. And, and Richie, you know, he loves his fish and he loves, <laughs> and he loves, <laughs> and he loves the idea of these two. He loves joining their theater company and training with them. And he wants to kind of 
just keep advancing that art. And he loves the idea of doing justice, only to, I think, when he sees through the curtain at the end, you know, where we've come since then, quite frankly, is that a briefcase of money is a very quaint thing. And today it's tens or hundreds of millions of dollars that change hands legally uh, through the Koch brothers or through you know, any number of legal channels. And it's just beyond even, that was a much more innocent world. You know? So uh, Richie just peers behind that curtain. And uh, I love seeing his face at the end of the movie. He says, that's what I was trying to do. You know? I mean, that's just a very real moment for me.